doing um, a lot of amazing stuff when it comes to the development of desire, where it comes from, um, how we go about, I guess, learning. Different people have different interaction with, um, I guess, exposure to their desire. So the biggest thing is um, most people start desire from an early age, especially if trauma is involved, um, not physical desire, but the mental kind of aspect. So um, we're going to get into a bit of that today. And the person that I've invited to come to the show today is going to be someone that um, is going to give you a little bit of information about where they came from and um, the development of their desire. So it's going to be a fun journey. <clears throat> Hi, Cigarette. Can you hear me? Hear you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. How are you today? I'm good. Feel better after your nap? <laughs> I did not know I needed a nap so badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened the other day. <laughs> well, I think it's a lot to do with um, I've been eating things I shouldn't be eating, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, I've been very, very uh, <sighs> careless with what I've been consuming, so I'm paying the Paying the toll. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll be back on track. Yes. Definitely need to get there. Especially, you know, because of work and all the amazing things like this that I'm doing. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm, I'm excited for this. As am I. Um, okay. So we got everything situated for, can you see my whiteboard? Um, yeah, it says fetish and kind of gives a definition, some okay. definition there. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, the biggest thing that we're going to talk about today is, uh, where desire develops, how we go about that. So, um, let me go ahead and jump into our first question. Um, okay. how old were you when you noticed that you had a different kind of attraction? So, um, maybe something that happened when you were a kid or something that happened when you were a preteen or teen, something that made you notice, Hey, I'm attracted to that. Right. So, um, and this is where it's, you know, everybody's story is a little different. So it was very young for me. Um, it was, I was actually four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, my birthday is in September. Um, so it's coming up. And so it was in the summer uh, I was four. It was the summer before I turned five. Okay. And it started with a neighbor. Now, since it did start so young, was there something that happened that made it more impressionable for you? Something that just kind of made it stick? So, okay. So this is something, you know, with fetish that, you know, uh, a very common story with fetish in general is, you hear the teenagers, right? Like, you know, in my case, my fetish is smoking, you know, Hey, I was, you know, I was 14. My neighbor lady was out bathing, sunbathing and smoking a cigarette. And, and I always got, that. I understood that, right. The hormones you're, you're, you're coming into sexual maturity. That always made sense to me. Right. It never right. really made sense to me why something so young happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, a younger, I guess I just wondered why it was different, but as I got older, I, I looked into it. So, Here's how I believe it started for me. Um, about this time, um, I had had two eye surgeries when I was young. Prior to d starting school, I had lazy eye, mm -hmm. and I had each eye operated on to help correct that. Okay. This started right around that time. So I'd had a surgery. And how I remember all this is because um, one of my earliest memories is you know, her smoking outside and there's these dirt piles and where the dirt piles come in is they were building a garage. And that's how I was able to taste, trace the time frame back. Cause I looked back on the auditor's website. I saw when this garage was at it. I'm like, okay. And it all lined up with me having the surgery. Right. 
And so, you know, a lot of times it's a traumatic event. And I never really felt like I had a traumatic childhood, but a, a friend one time said, well, it's hard to see what a child finds as traumatic. And that was kind of a light bulb moment. Right. And then I kind of started thinking about the, um, about the surgery and I don't know how far you want me to go here, but I mean, I tell you the whole, where I think it started. Oh, we can, we can dig into all of it. I like all of okay. it. Okay. So here's my theory and, you know, could be right, could be wrong, but this is my theory on this of how I feel this happened. Again, it was right around the time of the surgery. So they're building this garage and there's dirt piles and all the kids are out there playing on the dirt piles. And I can't play on the dirt pile because I had eye surgery. So they don't want me on the dirt. So I got to wear sunglasses. I got to sit up with the adults. You know, I, 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 can't, I have to observe. I can't participate. Right. And um, the neighbor lady, my parents both smoked. It was, this is the early 70s. A lot of people smoked. It wasn't uncommon. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, she's kind of the in charge figure, right? She's, I have to listen to her because right. it's her house and I'm there and I'm the kid and I have to listen and I have to do what she says. And she's smoking. And I think I noticed her smoking. And I noticed this from the way a child would look at it, not the way an adult would look at it. So, you, you know, you look at the cigarette, it, it has no choice in what's happening to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the smoker decides when it's going to be smoked, when it's going to be, you know, it's going to be lit on fire it's, you know, when she drags on the cigarette, it kind of, you know, moves sometimes almost like it's struggling. You know, when the ash gets large, she, she strikes the cigarette, you know, when she's done with it, you know, she discards it, throws it away, steps on it, whatever. Right. It's kind of a violent act from the eyes of a child looking at it. And, you know, I was in the position where I had just gone through surgery and everybody's poking and prodding and, you know, everybody's telling me. And so I kind of had this feeling where I've sort of, I guess, bonded with the cigarette. Mm hmm. And so my early feelings in this were it's solely centered around her and her smoking and basically feeling sorry for the cigarette. Mm -hmm. So that's the early part of how it started. Very nice. Very nice. I really like how you um, took the initiative to dig back into it and see, well, why was I attracted to it at this time? And what happened? What could have been significant to make me more attracted to it or make it more impressionable? Um, not everyone does that. So some people kind of know around about, you know, why they were attracted to what they were attracted to. They're maybe like, oh, well, I'm attracted to this because when I was a kid, spanking, for example, when I was a kid, I used to get spanked and, um, that's kind of the only attention I ever got from my family or the opposite end of the spectrum. They're like, oh, well, I never really got spanked and it made me wonder what it felt like. I needed that kind of discipline. So um, they kind of know that, but it's not one moment that they can pinpoint and then just do research to find out, you know, well, why was that so impressionable to me? So I really enjoy yeah. that. You actually look back at your timeline and everything. Yeah, well, you know, it's also sort of something I, I always wondered why me, right? From the very right. beginning, I, you know, even as a child, you have this sense that you're different and you wonder why you are. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it's again, it was a journey. It's, you know, at this point, this has been an almost 50 year journey for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the Internet is now a part of it, but it wasn't always a part of it. Right. The Internet didn't exist in the early days. So <laughs> right. um, I didn't really become aware of the smoking fetish community until my late twenties when I got on the internet. So it was kind of through my thirties that I, you know, kind of found more about it, understood more about it. And then in, in through like my late, like into my forties was really where I started doing that kind of research and digging back right. through. Well, it's really nice that the internet was available so that you did know, Hey, this is what it is. So there's not that lingering, lingering curiosity that just kind of is at the back of your mind, always, always just there and unexplained. Uh, because once you start to understand where your desire came from and you start to understand a little bit of yourself, it makes you appreciate who you are more as long as you accept yourself. So um, I think a lot of people have trouble with their desire and accepting their self because they're extremely confused. Um, and I mean, you know, we're told it's like deviant behavior. So that kind of scares people away too. Um, 
so my next question that literally opens up for that, do you consider yourself a pervert? Great question. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't really so much now, I guess. I mean, we, we joke about that, you know, where you say pets and pervs. And I said, well, I guess I'm kind of a perv and, you know, things like that. But yes, at, at one point in time, it's pr- very interesting you bring that up because, um, again, this started at four years old. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea, you know, even if you you're, you're, you have no concept of, of fetish, of sex, of anything at four years old. Right. So, you know, through I have this throughout my childhood. And it's with me, but I don't understand what it is or why I have it. Mm-hmm. And at the age of 13, I read a book that a neighbor gave me called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Mm-hmm. And this was written in the 1960s, a very enlightened decade. So this psychologist wrote it and I read it. And there's a chapter on sexual perversion. Mm-hmm. And in there, it describes what a fetish is. And I realized, well, what I have is a fetish. So I have a name for it now. But it's, uh, it's a fetish. And I'm a pervert, right? I'm a sex pervert. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, of course, there's now I know there's hundreds of fetishes, but then I didn't know that. And so right. I read all through it and it doesn't mention anything about smoking or cigarettes. And I'm like, well, and I've invented a new type of fetish. So I'm a pervert and I invented a new fetish. Yeah. That's what I think, 13 <laughs> years old reading this, right? And I don't really know any different until I'm in my late twenties and I get on the internet and I discover the um, smoking fetish community. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, I didn't invent it. It's been around for a long time. In fact, even before the internet, there was a, there was a magazine called smoke signals devoted to it. Mm -hmm. um, Much like a playboy or person. And um, there's lots of people out there like that. So um, yeah, I did definitely in, in the early days. I definitely did. Whenever you thought that um, you were just like odd, different than other people, and you didn't really know what it was, like any kind of label or name or anything like that, did you feel like you were alone? Did you feel like um, there was just no one that you could talk to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You feel you feel alone. You feel ashamed. Uh, you feel embarrassed, right? Because inevitably, a part we haven't really gotten into yet, but from the early part of this, from the earliest stages of this, uh, uh, the other aspect is, uh, even in, like I said, as a child, is masturbation, right? And, right. you know, you would go off and I would sneak off and, and as a kid, you don't have a lot of privacy and you get caught sometimes and then you get yelled at and, you know, now you're embarrassed and you're ashamed and, yeah, it, all of that. Right. So... With, of course, um, all of the, I guess, exposure you had at a really young age that kind of made you more drawn to it. Was there anyone in your life, uh, whether it be, you know, um, on a private level or a professional level, where you thought that you could talk to them about what you were going through mentally with everything? Absolutely not. Not, not when I was younger. Mm-hmm when I was younger. I mean, I grew up in a small town, you know, that was probably 20 years behind the times. I mean, no, absolutely not. Right. I mean, I never, I have a close friend, um, female friend who's just that a friend. And um, I've been friends with her for, oh gosh, over 15 years now. And at some point I admitted it to her um, because she's, pretty open-minded, right? And right. she had been pretty open with about her sexual encounters and different things. So we talked. And so I did admit it to her. And she's really the only, well, one of the few people in my actual, re- in real life that really knows about it. Mm-hmm. Hardly anyone does. Anyone does. Most all that would know would be in the, um, you know, within the community that I've met right. through the community. Okay. So <clears throat> even though, like um, there are different types of fetishes and different types of desire. There's one thing that stands true, um, I guess, with anything that's considered deviant or different. And that's that regular society doesn't really accept them. So I, I put up the um, definition for fetish so that anyone watching the 
the interview today can kind of see where we're coming from. Fetish is a form of sexual desire in which gratification is strongly linked to a particular object or activity or part of the body other than sexual organs. So for any of you that don't really understand that, um, that's kind of how your desire can start at an early age and not be sexually fixated, um, which is kind of like cigarettes desire today. Um, he, he's explaining, you know, um, around the summer before he turned five. So you don't have to have uh, moments in adulthood where your fetish or desire develops. Actually, it's more common for it to develop at a very, very young age, especially some event or some person or just some action that made a moment impressionable for you. Um, I have quite a few of those. So I always enjoy listening to other people where their desire develops and, and how it kind of grew over time. Now, um, Cigarette, whenever we're talking about um, your desire from where it started whenever you were four or five years old and as you got older, did you notice your desire growing or did you just kind of step into it? Was it already completely there or did you did it get more pronounced as you got older? No, I, th I think it was an evolutionary process for sure, right? So again, started very young, started solely with this one person mm -hmm. and her smoking, right? And then, and again, it, it, very early on feeling sorry for the cigarette, that, that, that feel, those feelings. And that kind of, at some point, you know, the larger awakening of, of noticing other female smokers, right grew right and so i started noticing others i can't really say you know was that was that a year was that two years was it six months that part i can't really you know that long ago i can't say but it, it it did develop into that and then the the feeling sorry for as i got older and there was a little reasoning there i realized well i really want to see that it was more that i wanted to be the cigarette i wanted to experience what the cigarette and i imagine when i was masturbating i would imagine i was the cigarette and those things were happening to me. So whenever you look at your desire and where it started, I noticed some keywords. You, you definitely favored um, the authority figure. You favor, favored a, kind of a strong woman. Is that something that you've always been drawn to in your life? I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, I think, you know, and, and you know, some of my interest and in, in things, I, if I think about it, and again, I can't say if this is true for everyone, but I think of everything that I find attractive, mm -hmm. it all dates back to there, right? Um, I have a preference for women to wear little or no makeup. Well, think about it, a neighborhood mom, she doesn't get up and get made up every day. She's just kind of herself, right? right? So I think that's where those preferences come from. And yes, the strong female, the idea of being in charge and, Yes, that, that I think that it all things stems back to that, I believe. Very nice. Um, so whenever, of course, you had the issues with your eyes and it's after the surgery, after your recovery, and you notice, you know, you're looking at the world a little differently. Did it make you focus more on people that were in an authority role now that you could see them more clearly? Um, I don't know really that so much. Um, I think, like I said, I think, you know, I was, I was an only child and my parents um, were older when I came along. Um, and I think they always treated me. And I think to their credit, I mean, they were great parents treated me, um, as an adult, right? There, there were certain expectations of how I was supposed to act. I mean, not unreasonable, but just, you know, they, they treated me more as an adult. Like, you know, if they went out to dinner, I went out to dinner. They didn't leave me with a sitter. I mean, occasionally that, that would happen, but mostly I, I would go with them. I would do these things. And so, you know, I know when we go to a restaurant, I'm expected to act a certain way, things like that. Right. So I think I always kind of was like mature for my age because of that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, you know, like I said, I think with the early on of being uh, with with the the 
don't know, being forced to push, push on silence, not play with the kids, but observe. I think that kind of made me an observer throughout life. And I think I'm, I, I think it, it, there's some things that, I don't know if we'll get into that later, but you know, you know, there's positives and negatives to these things. And, um, you know, one of the positives, I think I have very strong observational skills and I think I'm more observant than others. And I pick up on things. Right. You think that's because of the expectations you had and the older generation that you were with? A little bit of that, but I also feel like a lot of the fetish itself has a lot to do with it. Right. Because I, you know, again, pre-internet, I couldn't just fire up a, and I didn't have an iPad to just fire up and look at whatever I wanted, you know? So, you know, it was observing the images and remembering the images and burning them into my memory for later. Um, I have an extremely good memory. People that obviously know nothing about this that I encounter through my work and other things. Man, you have a really good memory. You have a, you have a really good memory. And I, I really, I really do attribute it to that. Very good. Very good. Now, um, it's interesting that you were talking about the pros and cons because that's what we we're going to talk about next. Uh, <laughs> so when it comes to your desire, I know um, very, very few people can look at something and be like, oh, well, right off the top of my head, these are the pros and these are the cons kind of thing. But with you being so observant and doing so much research and being so open to, I guess, diving into your desire, you might be able to give a little bit, I guess, broader spectrum of the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So tell me about yours, the pros and the cons. Okay. All right. So um, we'll go pros first because I try to be a positive person. I know you, you do <laughs> as well. So let's let's go over the positives first. Right. So the positives, like I said, memory, you know, I, again, like I said, you know, I had to, you know, remember it was important to me. Right. It was important to me to remember every detail for later. So mm -hmm. I was very observant. So observant, seeing things that others wouldn't see uh, memory. So very good observation skills. Um, and very good memory skills. What's funny about that is when I was a kid, I often got the the, the critic the criticism uh, on the report card um, doesn't apply himself, right? Mm -hmm. and I go, kid, I thought that's so unfair. Like, man, I'm trying. I really am trying. But what they could see in me that I couldn't see because I was too young was if there was something I wanted or something I I was interested in, I could recite every last detail about that thing. Right. <laughs> Now you know, you know, now you want to ask me my spelling words. You want to ask me about a date in history. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't, you, know, so that, you know, I couldn't, my brain wasn't trained enough at that young age to be able to focus it wherever I needed it, just where I wanted it. Right. As I got older, I did well in school because I could do that. And it, and it has served me very well in my job. So, and, and also too, I, I organized things. And, and, and let me explain. So again, let's let's go back to the very first one. It was just the neighbor. I played with her kids, right? So let's say it's summertime. I'm over there and I'm playing with them for you know a couple hours as kids do back then. We didn't have video games. We're playing, and through the course of the time and being over there, I watched her smoke three different cigarettes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, each one of those cigarettes is unique, and I would try to remember each one and categorize each one and and everything about that whole experience as much as, as, as I witnessed or whether I witnessed the whole thing or part of it. Right. Now I'm a little OCD, but not massively OCD, but this is where this kind of came in because later on that night, I would have to masturbate three times once for each one of the cigarettes. So, you know, organization, compartmentalization, memory, observation, um, I, I taught myself critical thinking skills at a very young age, and um, <laughs> and, and it is honestly, I really do believe that, and I do think it has served me well, you know, in my in my personal life, in my vanilla life. Mm -hmm. So, I think all that's positive. Those those are what I would see um, as the positives. Um, the other positives out of it, kind of, is. Um, in, in more, more so in like, you know, I've met people or um, talked to people I probably wouldn't have talked to in pursuit of the fetish, right? Because, mm -hmm. well, they spoke or, you know, something like that. And, and, and um, now in the community, you know, with the models and different ones, I've made some really good connections and friendships. And, and so I, I see that as a positive, right? Right. Certainly. Being so to navigate, um, to navigate around um, part of your life. That's 
definitely mm-hmm. a positive that you could take from it. Yeah. So, so the negatives. Well, I noticed there, a there's a host. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there's 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 a host of negatives. Um, you know, the, <laughs> so again, I've dealt with this for my entire life, essentially, right? Right. You know, coming up on fifty years now, and 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 I've seen. You know the evolution the fed is sort of evolutionizes right you know from in person to you know in televisions and movies and and you know magazine ads to the internet and then different aspects of the internet and things of that nature um but the the negative is is this so at a young age this this habit started where i'm watching a woman smoke i'm masturbating um and it becomes a daily thing right and so daily masturbation from such a young age is probably not a healthy way to develop your sexual, um, your sex life, right? And I um, feel that my, my sexual growth was stunted as a result. And I didn't really date and have normal sexual encounters through my younger years. Right. Um, and, you know, when you, you masturbate a lot, it's a solo act. And it's just you. And so, um, you know, to this day, I'm single. I've never been married. I've never had kids. Um, I do live a rather isolated existence. Um, there are sexual issues, right? I have intimacy issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't. Because the fetish is, the difference between fetish and kink, you know, kink is a preference. You know, mm-hmm. I can have an L6, but it's hotter if I'm tied up. Right. But a fetish is a requirement. It has to be there. So if you're trying to be intimate with someone and that thing isn't present, then it has to be in your mind. And so, you know, one of the things with sexuality is, you you know, closeness, right? And if somebody zoned out, there's not that closeness. Right. So it, it has had a an impact on my um, personal life. And um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely... Um, and, and I think not everyone with a fetish experiences that, not everyone with a, a, a smoking fetish. I think it depends where it develops and how uh, strong it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, it was very strong. And um, yeah, so, like, again, probably un- unhealthy sexual. Too. Mm-hmm. Yours was extremely young. Um, yeah. Your, your fetish desire developed so young that it was literally a part of who you are for the majority of your life. So that kind of goes into your evolution as a person too. Um, and whenever we look back at, you know, some of the key words that describe fetish, it, there's a fixation. Eventually there was a sexual fixation, you know, it becomes an obsession, a compulsion, um, a weakness. Like people don't understand that it's literally like a requirement, like a ritual that has to be done mentally for you to be able to to get where you need to be. So since you're just developed, you know, right before you were five and you've literally had it your entire life, it's like everybody that came into your life kind of already had to have this prerequisite in order to um, essentially be compatible. So it makes it harder um, because yeah, everybody and- else is looking for all oh, long hair or short hair or uh, blue eyes, but you, you have to have something in addition to, so that makes yeah, it and, harder. And I've dated both ways, but I've not really dated a lot. I mean, the other thing of it is, 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 you know, I, I kind of am more asexual than anything. I'm really not that interested in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and again, probably because, you know, it was just such a, a thing. The, the other thing about it is, um, as a child, um, because I developed it so young, and I guess I guess this is uncommon in young children. Two two things, I guess. What I've, what one of the things I've read with this is, children often will masturbate as a form of self soothing. Yes. And I think that was probably true with me, right? I'm seeing this, and I'm I'm feeling these emotions, and I'm, you know, of of watching the cigarette, and I'm, I'm feeling all this, and I believe that I'm feeling empathy, and then that's how I'm dealing with it, right? I'm I'm going right. off, and I'm I'm calming myself. Cause you're doing it to the point of exhaustion. Right. And so, you know, the way that took place is, you know, I'm laying on a floor on my bed, my hands tucked under and kind of, you know, kind of grinding away. 
that continued, usually children, you know, kind of phase out of that. And then maybe it kind of doesn't become a thing for a while. And then, you know, as, as teens, they'll maybe, you know, a male will, you know, more traditionally jack off. Right. Mm -hmm. But for me, that continued master being that way well into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And that also causes some issues with loss of sensitivity, ability to main, get and maintain an erection, all, all kinds of things. So, so yeah, so there was a host of issues related to that. Um, so that's probably the, the negative of that. Hmm. Now, with the evolution of um, where you started and then kind of where you are today, at around what age did you notice it becoming more sexually related? So not just, hey, I'm attracted to this, but I really need to touch myself because of this. Oh, I mean, honestly, um, I, I don't, I, I think that was from the, I mean, I, I can't tell you at what point, but I would say by age seven, it was a daily habit. No. And, and again, you know, we're talking a lot of times, multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. And the majority of that was focused around the exposure you had to the neighbor? Um, well, the neighbor initially, and then again, it, it branched out fairly quickly into other, other females as mm -hmm. well. But I mean, what happened was attraction, like if you saw a male smoking, it did not do the same thing as a female smoking. It had to be. It, a female yeah, smoking. It, it did. Yeah, it did. Oh. It did. Absolutely. Um, and, and the other interesting thing about that is, um, you know, my mom was a smoker and it really didn't have an impact, you know, right. um, in fact, I didn't really like that my parents smoked, you know, <laughs> um, but, um, so the, the, the other thing that where I'm trying to think where I was going to go with that, um, the, the, the branching out. So, and I don't remember the age, but I remember, you know, and this is, I guess, where like, you know, somebody knows they're addicted to something or they're drawn to something or whatever, mm -hmm. um, when I was in probably about the fifth grade, I think my neighbor quit smoking altogether. And, um, but like most smokers, they try a couple times. Right. Right. So I remember her, her, and my mom sitting and they used to have coffee and talk and she said she was going to quit smoking. And I overheard this and I thought, Oh my God, what do I do? Like, <laughs> what, you know, what, she's not going to smoke. Like, I don't, that's going to take something, you know what I mean? Because now this is something that's become a regular thing for me. Right. And, um, then that was kind of when I started branching out and noticing other women. And um, it was just sort of a rationalized thing, I guess, at that point. And then she started again. And I remember one time she had quit and then I found out she started again. I was very excited. And, um, <laughs> you know, and um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that was, it was, you know, so, but yeah, it was very early. It was very, very early. Um, the, 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 the interesting evolution there for me is that, if you're four or five, everybody's older, right? Oh, yes. They're all right. older smokers. And then I get to like high school and now high school girls smoke, right? So it's like kind of my peer group, getting into my peer group and older, you know? Right. And, and then, so it was my peer group and older. And then after you get a certain age, then it's like your peer, you're a little bit older, your peer group and younger. And now I'm in the phase where it's pretty much majority are younger right? They're all younger. So it's, it's like completely flopped from where it was. And, um, it was interesting when I was younger, I was always attracted to older women. And now that I'm older, I'm attracted to younger women. So. Very, it's very perceptive. Um, and it's not very often that someone looks back and kind of digs through everything that they experienced to find out exactly where something was. They're just kind of like, oh, yeah, I like this just because maybe I saw a neighbor do it one time. But, but you have these in-depth stories and it's just like you had this continuous, why did I do that? Where did that come right. from? I, yeah, I am a little more introspective, I suppose, than most. I like to know why things are the way they are, not just that they are. Um, right. And 
again, I think because this thing has been such a big part of my life, I want to know more about it, right? Some guys have a fetish, but it's not necessarily as consuming for them. For me, it's just so, it's been such a consuming thing. So that's why, um, and, and like I said, you know, I still have images in my brain from when I was a kid of, of seeing different women smoke, you know, I've thought about that too. I've just thought back and thought of like, how many women have I watched <laughs> over the years? Like, I mean, is it, it, could it be in the millions? Like, it's clearly definitely in the thousands, but is it, you know, hundreds right. of thousands? Like, I, I wouldn't even know how to quantify it, you know, but yeah. Well, I'm super glad that we had this interview today. It's definitely one of my favorite interviews. <laughs> well, good, good, good. But um, I will let you get back to your night, but well, I look forward to talking. One other thing I'd like to, if we can, just real quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so something that I've thought about as we were going to do this interview, mm -hmm. um, so something that doesn't come up much in, so for, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this because there's a ton of stuff on BDSM and different kinks, but there really isn't a lot on fetish, right? And yeah, no, there's not. It's, if, if it's usually done, a lot of them do it in sort of a mocking tone, so I, I think it's nice to, that you're doing this, um, but something that again, comes up because I'm constantly thinking about different things is, um, you know, something I don't think really gets talked about. It's talked about in kink because um, everything is about consent and, and, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I totally get. But in, in fetish, something, you know, there's the ethical or moral aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of different fetishes and mm -hmm. there's dark, some of them have some dark sides to them, right? And, you know, um, how far do you go in satisfying a fetish? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's just something I've thought about, right? Um, you know, in my own life, you know, with, with the smoking fetish, mm -hmm. you know, it's been a big part of my life and it's brought good and bad as I've shared. But, you know, let's be real, smoking is not a healthy activity. And yes. um, both of my parents smoked and both died from smoking related illness. So I've had feelings of guilt for being attracted to such a thing. Right. And, you know, that's been something I've dealt with off and on. And so then I think others may have that, too, with with different things. You know, there's a whole dark side aspect. Oh, yes. To the smoking fetish, which uh, the centers around being attracted to the damage and wanting to know about that. And I totally avoid that. Like if, if that I mean, I just want to stay so far away from that because it's just not at all my thing. Right. I mean, I understand it is for some, but like, you know, a lot of models, call, if, if a model mainly caters to that, I stay completely off her stuff. If one kind of does a little bit that I just skip over that, but th that is something. And like I said, I think it comes into play with, with other fetishes. You know, we've kind of talked about some of the fringe and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, you know, the ethics and morals of pursuit of, of fetishes is, well, is something I think. You're also very empathetic and you don't always see that in clients, submissives. So whenever it comes to the empathetic portion, the, I guess, more higher moral standard. Not everyone has that. Um, a lot of people think that they want the dark. They think that they want the, you know, grotesque. They want all this. They want the misery side. In reality, they don't. They're just searching for something to make them feel. So right. they, they don't explore and they don't really understand who and what they are because they're told oh well you have to do the worst thing possible to get attention or you have to be the nastiest you can be in order to keep somebody's attention whenever it's in this kind of world and it's not there's so many different levels and a lot of it is you finding the fit for you so there's all kinds of pro doms and insta doms and lifestyle doms out there I mean, there's mommy doms, there's daddy doms, there's um, extremely, you know, aggressive doms, there's soft doms. It's, it's just a matter of you getting to know someone before you approach them and know who and what they are and what they offer. Some people do prefer the darker things in life. I mean, not just something that's sexually related, but that's kind of where their mind stays. So they prefer the dark because it's comfortable. And um, a lot of that has to do with trauma that's experienced from early childhood. So people that do like the darker things have usually had some pretty traumatic experiences and never really got over them. 
So it's really individual whenever you look at, um, is this what I prefer? Is this what I really want? And why, why do I want to be in this kind of subspace that I'm in? So you don't really prefer the darkness. As you said earlier, you, you kind of want to be a more positive, more upbeat. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, like I said, it depends on the, the environment. Like I said, you know, some of my other fetishes outside of it and, you know, the harsh, but you know, I, I, yeah, I, I wrestle with the moral side of it sometimes. Right. And well, I mean, that's just part of who you are. You're very, you're very empathetic, empathetic and understanding person. And that makes you question, well, is my desire affecting someone negatively? And that has a lot to do with you being a true sub too, with you accepting that, Hey, there's other people that could be affected by what I desire. And, um, I mean, that's just part of who you are. Not everybody has that, but it is a great asset. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I, I've enjoyed this. <laughs> I have too. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and kick you off because my time's running out. Yep, on I see you. that. But um, I'll talk more later. And Hey, y'all. Thank you guys for joining in. Thank you so much for being a part of um, the ever-growing podcast that we are now diving into the depths of desire. I'm, I for one, am super, super excited for the development that we're going to have. And I know that there's a lot of people that have plenty of questions that they don't have anybody to turn to. They don't have anybody that they're confident enough that they would be able to um, count their information as a resource to add to the knowledge that they have. And also they don't really get to ask as an opportunity because they feel like they got to keep their desires secret. So that's something that I hope to help with the podcast. I hope to develop over time. Hopefully this is a safe place for everyone. I look forward to the growth. I look forward to all the information and all the amazing people that we're going to be featured on. And I hope you do too. So with that, I will see you guys on the next podcast. I hope you have an amazing day. And um, hopefully you get some new information, new insight, and it allows personal growth. You guys have an amazing day. Don't forget, stay hydrated and stay frosty. Bye, guys.